Kirkendall, again, Mike Kirkendall, uh, geologist. I want to thank the Osage Nation and the Osage uh, Mineral Council uh, for inviting me. Uh, no, no one twisted my arm to, uh, to come speak today. It's uh, actually a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, I genuinely mean that. Uh, what I'm going to present today, uh, if I can maybe do this with both hands. Uh, some of it's, I'm used to giving more technical talks, more detailed. This is going to be a little bit of that, but a lot more, uh, well, maybe it might, might be appropriate to say arm waving, but it'll just be with one arm today. Geologists love to arm wave and talk about geology. But uh, I hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, I, geologists love uh, pictures. So, I have very few words on these slides, mainly pictures, because they speak the language well known. So uh, we'll get into this, but first off, I actually live in Skyfoot. I've lived up there for about 15 years. And uh, my wife and I just built a new home on Skyfoot Lake, so I plan to retire there. So uh, a little bit about me, I grew up in Tulsa. A little bit, I didn't say this, but... So I've been in Oklahoma most of all my uh, most of all my life, and uh, I want to stay here. So with that, I'll get started. A little bit about Felix Energy. Who is Felix Energy? I don't know if many in the room have heard of us, but we're a private equity company. We started uh, with four of us in about 2013. Uh, we're uh, headquartered in Denver. We had uh, private equity backing from NCAP uh, investments along with private investors. And uh, we're a fully integrated company. We have a midstream, we have a, a water company, and of course our energy company. We, uh, we uh, got our first foothold uh, in 2013 in the, what's now called Stack Play. And uh, we ended up selling that, we had 80,000 acres, we ended up selling that to Devon in uh, 2016. And we took uh, those proceeds uh, and we reformed as Felix Energy 2 and looked around and found a position in the Permian Basin in 2016. And uh, at that time we acquired 30,000 acres and now we have 60,000 acres. Um, uh, we've drilled I think the last count I saw was about 130 wells, all horizontal. Um, we had real saltwater disposal wells as, as well. And we have uh, a little over 50,000 barrels of oil per day production, and it's increasing. We have seven rigs running, all drilling uh, two mile laterals. So we're very busy, and we've got about 55 people now in the office. We, uh, we do things in the Permian that we believe exceeds most what other operators are doing. This is a pad, a mega pad that we have, and a lot of activity going on. Uh, we're targeting the Bone Spring and the Wolf Camp, A and B. Uh, and this is just showing the activity. Here's a pad that's got a well drilling, coil, to uh, coil tubing unit for a tow prep going on. We're building tanks for recycling and produce water. Uh, we're doing a frack, uh, central tank battery. So uh, a lot of moving parts. The latest thing, uh, this is a picture, a drone picture that was taken earlier this week. We've got seven, all seven rigs are on one mega pad right now, uh, rolling two mile laterals. So I counted the mobile homes out here, and there's over 50 of them, if you stretch that out, for, you know, the workers and, and offices and that type of thing. So huge operation. We've got a lot of field personnel as well uh, that does, that's not even accounted for in the office. So we're quite busy. So, you know, we're drilling unconventional. And... You know, part of what you'll see today is a little bit of conventional, a little bit of unconventional, but one of the things I was asked maybe to talk about is kind of outside of Osage uh, County, 
what are things, what, what's going on, what do things look like, and I'm going to try to prepare the trash just a little bit, but today we're in this mining stage, where we're grinding away on these developments, and uh, unlike the old days, when we drilled, they're still being drilled, but just pure vertical plays, vertical wells, conventional wells. But this is a quote from the APG president, Mike Hardy, that I thought was so, so perfect for today. When he says, as we move into the mining stage, one tends to forget that these plays exist because of reality. And then technology allows us to get the oil out. But the geology put it in, in, the, in the ground in the first place. So that kind of sets the tone, maybe, for the rest of the talk. And we'll go step through a few things. So, just stepping back historically, uh, where is oil first found? Well, you take the words of uh, Wallace Pratt, who was a very great early American petroleum geologist. He was uh, instrumental in the formation of the American Association of Petroleum Geologists right here in Tulsa. He, uh, he and others uh, basically promoted geology uh, and the scientific method behind it in develop, finding and developing oil and gas resources versus just wildcatting. Now that had its place, obviously. Some major fields were found just with wildcatting. And there's great stories behind those, all fantastic. But using the scientific method of geology and applying that in the subsurface proved itself successful over and over and over again as it has today. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are in an industry if we hadn't understood the rocks better, the geology better, and technology had not come along to actually deal with those very issues. So early in the exploration history, uh, domestically, it was obviously very important. This is a case in point. You've all heard of the first discovery of commercial oil deposits in the, in the, in the U.S. Uh, by Edwin Drake over in 1859 in Pennsylvania. Well, to my surprise, the first dry hole that at least was documented was the very second well that was drilled offsetting this discovery. Basically, showing that geology does matter. So that was kind of news to me. I didn't know that after four days of completing the first commercial oil run, there was a dry hole here, offsetting that. So really, it's all about the rocks. It comes down to the processes. Uh, this is a very colorful diagram that I got off the internet. It's a rock cycle. And just like the uh, the water cycle, where we all know what happens there, there is a rock cycle. It takes a long time, but you know you move from the deep uh, deep uh, magmas, you have volcanic rock, you have igneous rock, sedimentary rock, metamorphic rock. And so there's this, this process. So that's a fundamental principle for understanding geology. There's some other founding principles early on in uh, the development of, of controlling geology having to do with uh, perspectives of looking at the present surroundings that we all see, understanding it and using it as the key to the past. And this was a principle that was called uniformitarianism. In contrast to that, and, and very necessary is catastrophism, which we'll get into here briefly, I won't bore you too much, but that was a critical balance where things catastrophic, catastrophically happened. They happened. And so you have to combine these two to fully understand the complex history uh, and of the earth and the development of oil and gas uh, deposits. So here's just an example. Well, on the left is uh, uniformitarianism. This is a few photographs that just show some examples. This is Grand Canyon. Bahamas, Baham a shoreline here off our coast, and then a delta. These are uh, 
pro very process-based, usually sedimentary uh, processes that vary with rates. Okay? We understand that from walking out and seeing this on satellite or actually walking it or, or uh, floating the, the Grand Canyon. And we see the, the, the layers of rock. Well, this things that happen catastrophically, such as slides, landslides, tsunamis, mentioned volcanoes, and even meteorite impacts. These are very sudden geologic things that occur, and they're very impactful. And so those two things combined literally create the earth that we live on. So those are the, the, the big picture processes. So took this out of the news headline just as, as an example. Uh, not to scare anyone, because the probability is very low, but November 20th, we're expected to have a, a near uh, near orbit uh, pass of an asteroid that's quite large. And traveling at 17, over 17,000 miles an hour. Now this is about 10 to 11 times further out than the distance to the moon. So we're not in any harm's way. But all I have to say is that impact cratering is one of the most common features in the whole universe. If you look at the moon through a telescope, what do you see? You see impact craters. We're going to talk about one today that's here in Oklahoma, buried at 10,000 feet. Some of you are aware of where this is located. It has oil in it, oil and gas. But all this to say is, here's a case where geology happens, and it happens rapidly. And hopefully in our lifetime, and in our children's lifetime, and who knows how much further, we will never have to experience something like this that hits the Earth. But it has in the past. The rates were much higher in the early formation of the Earth than they are today. But this is a very common thing in the universe. So, backing up a little bit more. Uh, this map is a great map. It's a 2003 map from the United States Geological Survey. It's called uh, the North American Time, Tapestry of Time and Terrain. And it's very colorful. And what it does is it shows the age of the rocks based, oops, based on this the stratigraphic column. So the red hot colors are the oldest, the yellows are the youngest. So you look up here, this is the Canadian shield. Okay, this is all granites. And speaking of impact crater, the Hudson Bay here is one large impact crater. And then there's a smaller one that sits here. So that gives you some perspective of these things can be quite large. But several years ago with the Tulsa Geological uh, Society, we had a program where we would, members would sponsor a map like this. It was quite large. We had it framed. And we would donate these to elementary schools, junior highs, uh, even universities. And I would go in, say, for an elementary school class of sixth graders, maybe uh, several classes in an auditorium, and present the map, talk about it, and then the kids were able to ask questions. And I'll never forget, one little boy raised his hand, and the first question he asked for me was, are rocks man-made? So I answered his question. I didn't laugh. I said, they're not man-made, you know, they're natural, and I said sometimes there are fake rocks that do look like real rocks, and they are man-made, but real rocks are not man-made. Well, afterwards, his teacher came up and said, I forgot the little boy's name, she said, you never, ever ask questions in class, and you must have, with this man, what you were talking about, you must have really triggered something in his mind when I started asking questions. And I was like, that's the whole purpose of what we were doing in that effort at that time, is to get people don't see maps like this very often. They look and they go, well, where are the state boundaries? 
So everywhere you go, is you're surrounded by geology. And even in the state of Oklahoma, I mean, it's, for me, it, every day is a field trip. Even driving back and forth from Tulsa to Sky Tip or wherever I'm at. This geologic map of Oklahoma is very colorful, but it tells a story, a very complex story. Uh, rocks that were deposited in basins uh, tells a story of a major high up in the Ozarks. Tells a story of uh, thrust faulting that's very similar to the Appalachians in the Wachita's. Intrusions down in southwestern Oklahoma, the deep Anadarko Basin, and the boundary between Pennsylvania age rocks and Permian age rocks here. And then all the rivers that cut through all that. So everywhere you go is a field trip. With oil and gas, uh, all the distribution of oil and gas is controlled by geology. Whether it's the deposition of the rocks that created the oil and then the oil is in, or that sealed the oil, or whether it's heat and pressure uh, that create either gas, gas condensates, or oil. So you look at the map of Oklahoma and you go, well, there's a lot of red out in western Oklahoma, a lot of green in eastern Oklahoma. But there is a large tectonic feature that goes right through Oklahoma called the Nemaha Ridge. And there's a lot of earthquake activity that's associated with faulting from off of that Nemaha Ridge. But by and large, all the oil and gas that we see, it's all related back to geology and uh, the, the factors surrounding how oil got into the rocks. Geology also happens uh, without rocks being deposited. This is all well known. As many of you have felt the earthquakes in Oklahoma. This is a map that shows the cluster of earthquakes here in Oklahoma, central Oklahoma, up into Kansas. But there's other activity around Fort Worth, uh, the Eagle River Clay, out the Permian Basin, and particularly in the Delaware Basin. <laughs> So this is of major concern, especially in populated areas. Um, sometimes it is a, just a nuisance. Sometimes it is a hazard. But again, geology in action in the subsurface. Not only that, but this is a, a geologic phenomenon, even though it's a wind event, it deposits silt and clay. This is a massive dust storm. Uh, the Permian Basin near Big Street, Texas. And that's a scary looking thing coming, I would, I would assume, to be on the rig and see that coming. But again, it's geologic in nature. So let's, let's look at uh, the differences between some of the conventional and unconventional discoveries and talk about some of the key attributes. Uh, every one of whether it's conventional or unconventional, uh, every discovery has a story. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the stories are from the dry holes that have been drilled, either missing because they didn't go deep enough, or going deep but they missed the edge of the oil accumulation, uh, or they're in a zone that's wet with water and it does not have any oil gas in it. So, with unconventional, there's not the dry, quote, dry holes, but there's the wells, there are wells that are uneconomic because they either missed their target, they didn't stay in the target when they were drilling horizontally, they came out of it. And so those wells are economic failures and don't make the returns that you want. But both conventional and unconventional have in common the petroleum system has to be working. And what I mean by that is you need a, a source rock of the oil that generates the oil, usually an organic rich shale, mudstone. You need a reservoir rock, something porous and permeable, uh, sandstones, limestones, and there's other types. And you need some type of 
trapping mechanism that traps the oil and gas as it migrates up and out. And then you need, oops, back up. Then you need a some type of a ceiling rock that keeps it from migrating up and out because of buoyancy. So you need a working petroleum system. If any one of these is missing, you do you do not have an accumulation of oil and gas. Oil and gas may have migrated through. You have shows of oil and gas, but you're not going to have an economic uh, well. All right, now we're going to look at two examples that are unconventional and two that are more conventional. So <clears throat> this is uh, the scoop and stack plays here in Oklahoma. And most of you are familiar with these terms. But the scoops, the scoop play was really kicked off down here in about 2010, around 2010. The stack plate was not discovered until a little bit later. And this is uh, several displays here. So kind of zooming in on this display, this is from uh, New Deals, or in Canada now, since they bought them. Their lease position in the scoop and then what they call the merge area between the stack area here. But this is a large area and so some of the differences here occurred when uh, initially wells were being drilled in the scoop area for the Woodford Shale. So the source rock. This was the rock that generated the oil and gas. And just on a schematic, you be down here to the south in the scoop plate where you have thick Woodford here. And then up to the north you have thick Mississippian or Merrimack, which is Mississippian uh, silt stones. They're, they're not necessarily source rocks, although there is some, some oil that's generated, but not to the extent that it's generated in the Woodford Trail, which oil and gas migrated up into trapping it with the Chester. So one thing that's very interesting in this discovery was uh, I actually was at Newfield at the time and uh, was an exploration lead and my team we drilled the first step out of here for wood because there had been success down here so we came up here in the oil window drilled a Woodford test one of our best shows was in the Merrimack so we completed the Woodford well, flowed black oil. Unfortunately, it was about five or 600 barrels of oil a day, but what we spent, it was not economical. But it proved concept. But there was a great show in the Merrimack, so we got permission, we got money, and hauled off and drilled a horizontal well, first off, a vertical well, in uh, just north of that Woodford well in the Merrimack and took a core in the Merrimack. And that what basically was the discovery of the stack plate. We drilled a horizontal well, and it was commercial. We drilled several others, and then the whole play got kicked off. So there is a story behind all that, like I said before, in all of these places. The next one I'll move to is another unconventional. This is uh, where we operate in the Delaware Basin. Part of the overall Permian Basin, and this is a, a type log showing a big section of what we're initially developing right now, about 1,400 feet in our area. We've got about six target zones that we're targeting. We tested nine, so we're developing six. And we're right in the very core part of the thickest, oiliest, highest pressure uh, region of the, of the Delaware Basin. A lot of wells have been discovered uh, with vertical wells there back way back in the 70s. And uh, they just, they, they produced some oil and gas, but they were nothing fantastic. Horizontal technology came along and unlocked the ability to produce lots of oil out of these wells by drilling a mile or two miles, about 10,000 feet down, 10,000 feet up. This, this is an interesting one. This is a conventional. This is over in China. When I was at Phillips, our team drilled several wells in what was called Bohai, is called Bohai Bay, 
you can see from the state of Texas here how big Bovi Bay was, we had a concession of uh, over 2 million acres. And this was our last commitment well that we had to drill. Uh, we were getting ready to walk out. So we'd already drilled four or five other wells that weren't, the discoveries weren't big enough. And by that, 30 million to 40 million barrel oil fields, but for that area, they weren't big enough because of the cost of development was so great. So we had to find something bigger. And we drilled the Discovery Well here on this Ping Line 19.3 in May of 1999. And on the structure, based on a lot of size and work, vaulted structure that was about four miles wide and seven or eight miles long. And we encountered a hydrocarbon saturated section of over 1,800 feet, which we stacked up the Williams Tower three and a half times. Next time you drive by, just look downtown. That's a lot of oil stacked up, and it was stacked in sand, uh, interbedded sand. I can tell you other stories here. Okay. 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 Sure. okay. I can do that. So, uh, let me move on to the Ames real quick. This is the impact crater. Uh, concentric feature, 10 miles in diameter. At the R local level, 10,000 feet. Ended up having lots of oil and gas in it. It had a petroleum system that was working. So they're still drilling wells out here today. So all these have a common trait. They vary in size and scale, but they all have a working petroleum system. And you have to apply a lot of technology to unlock all of this. So just as a matter of scale, just for reference, this is the uh, Permian Basin, including the Midland, the Central Basin Platform in Delaware. That all makes up the Permian. There's the size of those stage caps right there, the Osage Nation. We're operating right in here. So that gives you a little perspective on scale compared to the Osage. So things look pretty bleak, as they say today, but this is another quote from APG uh, member that over the decades, uh, the oil and gas industry has risen above, and they found new oil and gas deposits. It's always been that. It's always been the case. Innovation, new technology, uh, that's what that's caused. So, I'll leave you with this last quote. Uh, one of my favorite of all time, this is uh, from a professor visit that was at the University of Tulsa, Park Dickey. Uh, he said, we usually find oil in a new place with old ideas. Sometimes we find oil in an old place with a new idea. But we seldom find much oil in an old place with an old idea. Several times in the past, we have thought that we were running out of oil and we were actually running out of ideas. And that's what I'll leave you with today. There's still a lot of oil to be found in the Thank you. <laughs> us today. His presentation was fabulous. I love the pictures and it's always good to know those those little quotes and understand, you know, the real business of drilling and finding the production that we hold so dearly. Uh, Mr. Carnegie, thank you very much.